Okay, everyone, Dave, Dr. Shock Becker here. And um, this video, we're going to uh, go back to something I did a little bit ago, um, looking at these, uh, I guess, these cases that I have uh, broken out by year, and I'm storing DVDs and Blu-rays in them from that specific time period. And um, I think that had, I did it for the 1970s previously. I know that video was over 40 minutes long. I got to tell you, this one... Uh, even though there's not as many movies in this case, this one is probably going to even be a little longer because I might have something to say about all of the films in this collection here because this, uh, uh, well, just to set it up, it's 1980, 1983, as you can see. Um, I had to break the 80s out into two separate uh, binders or uh, cases, if you will, uh, because I just had so many of them that I that I wanted to, to you know, to include. And this three-year time period, or I guess, you know, four years, whatever, um, were the most important in my, uh, I guess, my, the birth and maturation of my um, uh, cinephilia, if there is such a word, of, of my uh, film fandom. Um, it was 1981 that Rares of the Lost Star came out, and as I already mentioned in a previous video, that was when I fell in love with movies and wanted to uh, delve into them as much as I could. Um, 1981 is also when we got cable TV for the first time, and I was opened up to a new world of films uncut. Um, you know, obviously they were still full screen, they weren't letterbox yet, but still being able to see a lot of these movies of, uh, you know, different genres, um, uncut on my TV, that was, that was big, and it, it, it that, you know, sort of was the next level in my growth. And then in, in 1983... Um, I want to say mid-1983, we got our first VCR, and that started it all up again with just recording films and being able to actually watch them whenever I wanted, and um, yeah, so 1980 to 1983, this was, this was a big time for me, and um, uh, I'm going to have something to say, I think, about almost every one of the movies in here, and this case holds 192 titles. So uh, let's get started. All of these will have been released between 1980 and 1983. As I mentioned with the 70s, this is not every movie I own between 1980 and 1983. I have some special editions and whatnot that I could not break up and put in here. Um, I want to say Sudden Impact I know is not in here. And uh, you know the uh, Clint Eastwood, uh, Dirty Harry film. And uh, there are others. So this is, by, and by no means is this every movie uh, released between 80 and 83 that I own. These are just the ones that I was able to include in this binder. Let's get started. Uh, there it is. Pardon my reach. Across. Oh, and if anyone's interested, S the T. These these are my favorite cases. I like these better. I like these better even than the ones I had for the nineteen uh, nineteen seventy that I had. I love these because they give you more room for like the liner notes. And I use the covers of the Blu rays and all for these. Actually, not not many of them have liner notes anymore. But um, I don't even know if they're called liner notes. I think that's music related. But anyway, um, this these are my favorite. And you can see why. Um, you'll see why as I open them up. They give you a lot more room. So you get a lot more room for uh, for the covers. Start with 2019. Uh, after the fall of New York, I did see this. It is an Italian sort of uh, post-apocalyptic uh, film. And um, yeah, I enjoyed it. I know I reviewed it on the blog. Uh, so check it, you know, if you want to go out to dvdinfatuation.com, check out my review on this one. But I did enjoy it. Um, okay, 48 hours. Eddie Murphy's screen debut. He's brilliant in this film, as is Nick Nolte. It's funny. It's exciting. It's it's a buddy cop. It might have even been like one of the first buddy cop sort of films. Um, it's not the first Eddie Murphy movie I saw. I saw him in Trading Places before this, and then went back and watched 48 Hours. We rented the video. Well, that's another thing. And it was in uh, 1983 that we joined our, joined our first, um, or we uh, signed up at our first video rental palace. Not a palace. It was actually an old 7-Eleven. But um, it was a you know pretty special place for us at the time. So that's another thing that was big at this at this juncture of the this early part of the 1980s. Um, and we did rent 48 hours, and I remember really enjoying it. 
Nine to Five. This is a movie um, I saw in the theater in 1980 when it came out. It was a big box office hit. My parents took my brother and I to see it one Sunday afternoon, I want to say it was. And um, yeah, it's, it's it's a fun movie. Uh, you know, Dolly Parton, of course, has that uh, the title song that became a big hit, Nine to Five. And uh, just a good comedy. Absence of Malice, uh, Paul Newman, Sally Field. This is about a reporter. And um, uh, Sally Field plays the reporter. I think she's, uh, the, you know, Paul Newman. I, I don't remember a lot. I did see this movie once. I don't remember a lot about it. But I know that it, uh, Paul Newman and Sally Field are both excellent in it. Uh, Airplane. Yeah, what can I say? One of the great all-time comedies. Uh, another one we saw in the theater in 1980, my father took my brother, myself, and uh, our friend, our neighbor, to see it, and we were cracking up. We just couldn't stop laughing from start to finish. It is, it's, it's a classic, absolute classic. I love Airplane, and I love Alligator. Uh, uh, Robert Forster, you know, the, uh, the alligator, you're breaking through the street. Um, yeah, this is, this, is a, this is a fun creature feature. An American Werewolf in London. Um, obviously, the special effects of Rick Baker are what are most remembered. Not most remembered, but eh, probably. Probably what you remember most about this film at this point. But it is a good, uh, you know, uh, John Landis uh, sort of horror comedy as well. I first heard about this when I was in sixth grade. Again, I, as everyone knows, I think I went, uh, I've mentioned on the podcast several times that um, I went to Catholic school. And I remember sitting in sixth grade and my sixth grade teacher, Mr. Waters, talking about how this movie, when it's going to come out, is going to revolutionize special effects. And he was reading about it, and he couldn't wait to see the movie. Um, and I actually, looking back on it, that was a pretty cool, he was a pretty cool teacher, because he is also the one who, um, I remember at, uh, at one point during the year, he brought in uh, Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell and played the entire album for us, because he was uh, such a fan of it. And uh, I became a big fan of Bad Out of Hell as well because of, uh, because of that. Um, but I do remember him bringing this up in school and uh, couldn't wait to see the movie. Atlantic City. This was up for Best Picture uh, the year it came out. Burt Lancaster and Susan Sarandon. Uh, Louis Mel directed it. Really strong film shot in Atlantic City. And what I remember about this is my grandfather would always visit Atlantic City back then. He always went to the casinos. He was there when they were shooting this movie in one of the casinos, and he was in the background, he said, of one of the scenes. Um, I've looked a couple times I've seen this. I didn't see him. Maybe I just missed him, or maybe his scene ended up on the cutting room floor. You know, he just remembers being there when they were shooting it. I don't think he ever saw the movie to, uh, you know, to verify whether he's in it or not, but he was in the background while they were shooting one of the, the scenes for this film. Basket Case, uh, the Frank Hennenlopper, uh, Frank Hennenlotter, sorry. Um, a classic, I'm just going to say it. It's one of those ones, um, you know, set in New York, and it's uh, it's just a, 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 it's a fun horror movie. It really is. Uh, Battle Beyond the Stars, Roger Corman, you know. Um, this was, I guess, sort of... Um, Obviously, when Star Wars was starting to hit it big, or all of those sort of sci-fi films, um, Battle Beyond the Stars came out, and uh, yeah, Roger Corman, all you need to say. Beastmaster, uh, HBO, showed this movie all the time. It's uh, Don Coscarelli directed it, and uh, it's a good one. It, it It's, you know, I think this is, yeah, I have an import DVD for this, but uh, yeah, it's it's a good fantasy film. It absolutely is. Mark Singer plays the, the lead character, the, the beast master of the title. Um, and I think John Amos is in this as well, if I'm not mistaken. The Beyond, Lucio Fulci, is this, the middle chapter of his Gates of Hell trilogy. And I'm sure we'll be talking about the other two uh, later on. Um, but this is my favorite of them. And uh, just a great horror film. Uh, one of one of my favorite horror films of the 80s. I think I'm um, on, on Horror Movie Podcast, which you could check out at horrormoviepodcast.com. Um, uh, we were talking about our favorite horror films of the 1980s, and I know this one uh, came up. That was one of our October episodes. We did covered 
uh, in four consecutive weeks, the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, and the 2000s, giving our top 10 lists for all of those decades. So, um, and I know the Beyond came up uh, during that episode. The Big Red One, Samuel Fuller's uh, World War II film. And I read a biography on Samuel Fuller and was surprised how many of the scenes in this film were based on what he himself experienced. Samuel Fuller was there for D-Day. He was, he was on the beaches of Normandy and he did go through, um, you know, France and uh, during, you know, he, he was part of the Big Red One and, and he, would, he tried to make this movie for many years. When he started out, John Wayne was going to be the star. That's how many years he was trying to get this film made. Um, and even the scene of a woman giving birth in the tank, Samuel Fuller swears that happened while he was over in Europe, that, that, uh, that a, a woman had given birth in the tank. Um, and just a good movie and very dramatic too, uh, especially towards the end. Um, I know Mark Hamill was in it, um, Robert Carradine, uh, and Lee Marvin, of course, stars as the, uh, the sergeant in this. Everyone thought he was a little too old to play it. Maybe he was, but he's still damn good. Blowout. Uh, Brian De Palma. I actually have this also on Criterion. I bought the Criterion Blu-ray of this, and I'm, I plan to watch it with the special features. Um, but, uh, yeah, one of the great Brian De Palma films. And John Travolta is, is excellent in this movie. Blue Lagoon. All right. Um, saw this on cable. Never saw the whole thing, I don't think. And it's not, certainly not a good, I wouldn't even say it's a good movie. I'm going to say not great, but it's not even a really good movie. Um, but I got it anyway. And there it is. Uh, but again, I've seen parts of it on cable and it's, um, yeah, let's just leave that. Blue Thunder, Roy Scheider, Blue Thunder. Um, aside from being, you know, an okay film, uh, I remember reading Roy Scheider took the role in Blue Thunder so that he did not have to appear in Jaws 3. He hated making Jaws 2. He tried to get fired from the set of Jaws 2, and they just could not fire him because he was so important in the movie. Well, when he heard they were making Jaws 3, he took the role in Blue Thunder. Strict, not, well, I guess, you know, I'm sure he liked the script too, but he took the role in Blue Thunder so that he would not be available when they were doing Jaws 3. Turned out it was, a, they took the story in a different direction anyway, but he just wanted nothing to do with it. The Blues Brothers, John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, based on the characters from Saturday Night Live. Great music in this. It's funny as hell. These these two jazz music, uh, blues musicians, obviously not jazz, blues musicians, um, in Chicago, um, trying to put the band back together to raise money to save the orphanage where they grew up, um, and are getting and get many people angry along the way, trying to track them down and uh, well, basically kill them. Um, my I remember my parents saw this in the theater, and I remember they saw it on a Saturday night, because on Sunday morning when we got back from Mass, my father was raving about this film. He loved it so much. He liked the music. He thought it was hilarious. He couldn't stop laughing at the opening scene. Again, you know, he went to Catholic school also growing up. Couldn't stop laughing at the opening scene with the nun um, when they go back to visit her at the orphanage. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's awesome. And it's, it's a movie that still holds up. It's still still great. BMX Bandits. Brian Trenchard Smith um, directed. Has Nicole Kidman. She was very young in this movie. Her first movie. And um, yeah, just a, just a, it's a good kids film. It really is. I remember Quentin Tarantino uh, talking about how he prefers this to The Goonies. Body Heat. Um... William Hurt, I want to say Kathleen Turner's screen debut, I think it was, um, you know, very sensual film, uh, been a while since I've seen it, I know Mickey Rourke plays a role in it also, but um, good movie. The Boogans, what can you say, that, 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 that title and that artwork doesn't say already, um, and what does Stephen King say, I recommend The Boogans, wildly energetic monster movie, yeah, absolutely, um, definitely check it out. Brainstorm. Uh, this is a very clever premise. This is about uh, some scientists who develop um, a device that can, you can record your brain waves to the point, it's almost like virtual reality. You record your brain waves and then someone else plays them back 
and experiences what you experienced. It's almost as if like virtual reality, they become you and experience what you, um, you know, what you were going through when you, when you had this device on recording your brainwaves. Um, it is a thriller. Uh, I know there's a, uh, a scene where one of the characters, I want to say uh, Louise Fletcher, something happens to her, like a heart attack or something while she was recording. Christopher Walken wants to play it back, and um, but will he survive it? Natalie Wood's last film, she died either during the making of this or right after the making of it. And um, you know, I, I, for those who don't know, she drowned while uh, you know, on, a, on, a, uh, on a yacht um, at the time. And there is a podcast out there called Desert Island Discs. It's based on a, a radio show from England where they bring on celebrities from all, you know, from everywhere, you know, from uh, education, government, entertainment, to talk about the six albums they would bring with them on a desert island, and then they play a song from each one of them. Sometimes it's just a song they talk about, and they play that song. Um, on the podcast, they can only play a, a clip of the song for rights reasons, but Natalie Wood, back in the um, 70s, was one of the guests, and I'll never forget when they were talking to her about her biggest fear, she said her biggest fear was being alone in dark water. And I just thought, my goodness, how terrifying those last moments of her life must have been for her because she died at night. She drowned. Um, it's just terrible. Uh, you know, really sad. Uh, but anyway, uh, Brainstorm was her last film, and it's one I definitely recommend. Breaker Morant. I think it was in 2015 on the blog that I, I just spent a couple months watching as many Australian films as I could. I had seen portions of this on cable, actually. Prism um, from out of Philly played, uh, played Breaker Moran at one point, and I saw parts of it. But I finally got to see the whole movie, I want to say, in 2015, uh, or at least from start to finish. I think I'd seen you know it in bits and pieces several times. Caught most of the movie. But I got to see the whole thing start to finish, and uh, it really is one of the great films based on a, on a true story from the Boer War. Um, and Edward Woodward is a, gives a tremendous performance. It's, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, I have not seen Brimstone and Treacle. It stars Sting, and I've heard good things about it, so I don't have much to say about that. Uh, Burial Ground, The Night of Terror, an Italian horror film. Um, has, it's a zombie film. The zombies move very slow. There's a very memorable scene with a scythe and somebody leaning out of a window. But what you're going to remember about this film is the young actor, or not a young actor, he was, he was in his 30s or something at the time, playing a young boy who tries to seduce his own mother. And I'm talking, he's playing like a boy of 10 or 12 or something like that. Um, yeah, very, very strange film. Um, but I, you know, it's, it's an Italian horror film from the 80s, so it's crazy. And it's, uh, it, you know, it, it lives up to that reputation. The Burning... Um, Produced by the now, uh, uh, well, the Weinstein brothers. And, um, you know, they're not looked upon very favorably now, but it has Jason Alexander in it. Good movie. It's it's a great slasher film. Uh, Tom Savini did the effects for it, uh, set at a, at a campsite. Yeah, it's, um, you know, uh, if you want to go back to Horror Movie Podcast, we have we had Greg Amortis from Land of the Creeps as our guest, and we did a four-part series on the slashers of the 80s, and I think we did two full episodes on from uh, 80 to 81 and 82 to 83, because they were big years for slashers, and I know we talked about this movie in, in that Caddyshack. First heard about this when a friend of mine in school, um, they went to a drive-in, and it was a drive-in where you tuned into a radio station to pick up the audio. They went to see um, a Disney movie, and they ended up sitting on the hood with a little portable radio, watching uh, the screen across the uh, in the other lot where they were playing Caddyshack. And uh, my friend raved about it, and I couldn't wait to see it. My father did buy it on video. There was a time we weren't allowed to see it, but I, you know, we watched it anyway. Um, just, I love it. It's one of the, for me, it's one of the great 80s comedies. Uh, from the guy who, uh, they actually cover this in a, in a recent um, uh, movie on uh, National, oh no, God. What is it? Um, National Lampoon. Um, the biopic of Doug Kenny. What is that? A, a futile and stupid gesture or something like that? Um, on Netflix. And they cover a little bit about the making of this movie. But um, and I recommend that movie too. Uh, a futile and stupid gesture. Or so. I, I can't remember the exact title, but it came out uh, last year. Good movie. 
Um, but Caddyshack, I just love it. Cannibal Apocalypse, another Italian horror film from the 80s, probably the lesser of popular, of uh, or the lesser known of the Cannibal films released that year. Um, but, you know, John Saxon stars now. I remember John Saxon saying he never watched the movie because he thought it was foul and in bad taste. But I liked it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it has its moments and, um, and it has scenes of some pretty crazy violence and it is about zombies and um, it deals with the Vietnam War to a degree. Uh, it's a good one. But this is the one most people are going to remember. Cannibal Holocaust. I mean, what, what to say? I mean, uh, you know, a real animals are killed in this film. It is gruesome at the end. Uh, Ruggiero Diodato directed this. And, yeah, the, you don't go into this movie lightly. Let's just put it that way. This one um, could leave some major scars. Um, and if, you, if you're adverse to extreme violence, especially real violence against animals, and I don't know anybody who's not against that, um, you know, proceed with caution before watching Cannibal Holocaust. Um, but, I, but I still think it's good because it's an early version of a found footage horror film. Yeah, is how it's set up, and it's, um, it's a good one. Cannibal Run, <laughs> technically not a good movie, let's be honest, it's just not, but I love it. Um, Burt Reynolds, Dom DeLuise, Farrah Fawcett, Roger Moore, Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, um, Jamie Farr, uh, Peter Fonda shows up as well, Jackie Chan is in this, might have been his first American film. It's about a cross-country race, and all of these participants are just these bizarre people, um, you know, and they team up. Uh, Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. are gamblers posing as priests. Um, Adrian Barbeau is in this film. Um, Burt Reynolds uh, and Dom DeLuise get an ambulance. Jack Elam plays the doctor going along, and Farrah Fawcett plays the patient. To, so they figure if they're an ambulance, the cops aren't going to stop them if they're speeding. Um, yeah, just... Uh, <laughs> It, again, it's not a good movie. They show outtakes at the end, but it's one of those endearing ones where everyone's having so much fun. You just can't help but join in and, and uh, be part of the uh, part of the overall party atmosphere. Carney, um, this one's better. You know, I remember this on cable. I didn't really see it then. I watched it, you know, years later. It's a good film, and um, it's about uh, Carney folk, you know, and Jodie Foster joins them. Uh, um, tags along with Gary Busey and Robbie Robertson, who was, you know, a musician from the, the band. Um, yeah, it's, 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 you know, it is a good film and they do have some real life carnival folk, uh, carnival people, uh, starring in this as well. So, uh, well, we're checking out Cat People, the remake. Uh, this is a love it or hate it. Um, I enjoy it. I, you know, I maybe not love it or hate it, because I can't say I love it, but I certainly don't hate it. I did like it. Um, Malcolm McDowell, uh, Nastasha Kinski, uh, a remake of the 40s classic. Um, you know, it's worth seeing. The Changeling, George C. Scott. The, well, I don't know. what This, for me, is one of the great 80s uh, haunted house slash ghost films. Has an awesome seance sequence in it. Um... And George C. Scott is so good, he, get, he, he rents a house where a child was killed, and he has run-ins uh, with this ghost, and um, he's trying to figure out what happened. So it's got that mystery to it. I think Melvin Douglas is in this as well, if I'm not mistaken. Christine, um, John Carpenter, what more do you need to say? A killer car. I'm not afraid of killer cars. I've mentioned this in a podcast I know in Land of the Creeps, and I'm pretty sure also on um, horror movie podcasts where we were covering... Um, uh, Stephen King. This is based on a Stephen King work. I'm not afraid of cars. I think that if if you're well enough ahead of them and if you step out of the way, they can't like stop on a dime. Or they can't reach back and get you. But what really makes this movie so good is the character of uh, Arnie Cunningham. Um, he is the real horror in this movie and what he evolves into when he when this car sort of possesses him. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, that's what that's that's where the the real story lies in this film. But again, it's a great movie. It was a cable one. I watch it every time it was on. Um, there's a few of them in here that are that I, I'll say that about that. Whenever they were on, I would just sit down and watch, pick it up from whenever. Uh, City of the Living Dead. This is the first part in the Gates of Hell trilogy of Lucio Fulci's Gates of Hell trilogy, um, and uh, it's a good way to start off that series. Again, I think the Beyond is the best of the three, but uh, this is uh, this is good. 
class of 1984. It's been a while since I've seen this. Um, I gotta rewatch this. I gotta rewatch this again soon. But uh, you know, it's, it's a good one. Let me know what you think about any of these movies in the uh, in the comment section uh, that I'm talking about. But I've gotta rewatch that. Coal Miner's Daughter, one of the great biopics, I think. Um, Loretta Lynn, uh, Sissy Spacek plays Loretta Lynn. Tommy Lee Jones plays her husband. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a, it's a biopic about how she started out and, uh, uh, you know, as a coal miner's daughter and uh, very poor and married very young uh, and became a country music star. It's, it's really a good movie. I think it was up for Best Picture that year and rightly so. And I know that Sissy Spacek was at least nominated for Best Actress. I don't know if she won, but um, she's awesome. As is Tommy Lee Jones, by the way. Uh, this is one of the few Robert Altman movies I haven't seen yet, but um, I've heard a lot about it. Come back to the Five and Dine, Jimmy Dean, Jimmy Dean. I know it's based on a stage play, I believe. Um, I don't have much to say about it because I haven't seen it, but I do really want to see it. Conan the Barbarian. Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, this is a good... Uh, it's a better than good sword and sorcery, in, in my opinion. I think Schwarzenegger... Um, it's before he really broke out as a, as a major box office star. That happened in the later part of the 80s. Uh, but he was still setting himself up for this, and he was perfect in the role. And I remember, well, there's a sequence with the giant snake, but there's also a scene in this where uh, Conan is near death, and his compatriots are trying to stave off these ghosts that have come to collect him. And I remember thinking, you know, I know those are special effects, but damn, that looks good and creepy. And it was just, uh, I was so impressed by the way that scene looked and, the, and, and just how, uh, how dark and ominous the whole thing was. Um, you know, it, there's a lot to like about this film. That's just, that's just one part of it. But, you know, definitely, if you haven't seen Conan the Barbarian, uh, you know, you're doing yourself a disservice. Continental Divide. This was another cable film. It's one that uh, John Belushi movie doesn't get talked a lot about. It's sort of a romantic comedy. He plays a reporter who's hiding out from some, uh, from some. I want to say some uh, mobsters that he was. Um, he had done a story on, and he sort of hides. So he goes out into the mountains, where he hooks up with Blair Brown, and um, it really makes you. It, 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 you can appreciate John Belushi as an actor in this film. You really can. I mean, he's a great, he's a great comic. I think he was a comic comedic genius. Um, you, you see some of that in Continental Divide, but he was also just a good actor. And, uh, you, you get a sense of that in this film. Uh, Creepshow, George Romero. Um, the, for me, the best horror anthology ever made still is the original Creepshow. I love it. Um, I show, I was actually watching this with my sons in the room and I remember my oldest son who does not like horror sat and watched the whole thing with me and I was real impressed. I said, you know, bud, that's, I'm surprised you sat and watched the whole thing. Well, it turned out he was so scared by that opening sequence that he didn't want to get up and leave because he would have been by himself. Um, and my wife was working that night. So, um, yeah, creep show just, you know, uh, what can I say? It's a classic. Cujo, one of uh, my former co-hosts on Horror Movie Podcast and the current host of Considering the Sequels, Jay of the Dead's favorite horror films. Another Stephen King adaptation, and it's a good one. It really is. I know they did a commentary, him and his co-host from the um, movie podcast weekly, um, did, a, uh, did a commentary on this, uh, if you want to check that out. But um, yeah, Cujo, good film. As is Dark Knight of the Scarecrow. This was a made-for-TV movie. Um, but man, this is when the made-for-TV horror films really had some bite. I guess they always do. And then nowadays, it's, it's getting that way again. But um, you know, in the 70s and 80s, they were turning out great, great stuff. And Dark Knight of the Scarecrow was, was one of them. Das Boot. Uh, awesome World War II film. It's German. And um, yep, just a, just a really good movie. Long time since I've seen it. It's a long movie, too. But it's, uh, you know... Uh, if you're a fan of war films, uh, it's one that it's set on a submarine mostly. You're not going to want to miss it. The day after, this was a made-for-TV film about nuclear war, and it was meant to sort of you know scare everybody. And it, it, you need a movie to do that. But when this this played on TV um, early or late in 1983, and I was in high school at the time, and I remember three of my teachers that day talking about this film. Uh, that was playing later that night. It was a really big event at the time, and I, I think I'll, I mean, it had high, really high ratings when it when it did finally play. And then, of course, the next day, my science teacher was 
sort of um, dispelling everything and um, you know what was wrong with it and um, but it's it's powerful it really is um, uh, it's of its time because we were really were afraid of nuclear war back then not really uh, well no it's it's still you know front and center in the news today so um, you know but it's the day after Jason Robards is in it I know Steve Gutenberg is in it um, you know has a decent cast but it's pretty hard hitting as well um, so well worth saying. Dead and Buried, when I started the blog, the first director whose films I really sort of um, discovered was Gary Sherman, and he directed Dead and Buried. It's a really good horror film from the early 80s. Um, I recommend checking it out, but I know Gary Sherman's movies, will, at least one of them is going to come up later uh, in this video. The Deadly Spawn. One. If you see the trailer for this, you fall in love with it, and the movie is every bit as fun as the as the trailer, in my opinion. Um, yeah, um, real low budget movie shot. I want to say in New Jersey, uh, the creature doesn't look realistic, but it looks so cool. I think Gene Simmons owns one of the props from this movie, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if it's one of the severed heads uh, or what it is, but um, Deadly Spawn horror fan, definitely. If you're a horror fan, check it out. Death Trap. Um, I've spoken before how Poltergeist was the first movie I recorded off of cable. The first movie, or when we got our VCR, uh, the first movie our family, and we recorded, my family, or my father recorded, I guess. He was the very first one to record a movie. It was Death Trap. And I remember we were out for the day, and I wanted to set the timer for Poltergeist, so he was going to rewind his Death Trap tape. We did not know how to work the VCR at the time. It seems kind of silly now. But I remember... Before I saw Death Trap all the way through, I watched it in reverse, in fast motion, like it took 15 minutes, and I saw every scene going backwards, because we didn't know to hit stop and rewind, he just hit reverse, and we ended up, he's like, is this how it's got to be? This is no good. We ended up watching, I saw this entire movie in reverse in 15 minutes before I watched it the first way through. Um... It's a great whodunit. Sidney Lumet directs it. Michael Caine, Christopher Reeve, Diane Cannon. Um, and it's about a playwright who's struggling and he thinks he's going to steal a play written by one of his young students and he could pass it off as his own and he's going to kill the student. And so many twists and turns in this movie. It's, it's so entertaining. Uh, if you haven't seen Death Trap, definitely see it. The Devil's Sword. Um, Mondo Macabre. I'm going to talk about that label for a second. They are really putting out some some awesome uh, genre films. And this is an Indonesian sort of sword and sorcery. Um, and it's good. They put out other ones that are really good. Lady Terminator. Uh, the Girl in Room. Oh God, 2A. Or I, I can't remember the number now. Um but it's a good label, and I always watch when they put some new stuff out. I know they put out a couple Bollywood horror collections, um, and The Devil's Sword is is one of those films. It's just it's not it's cheesy, um, you know. The effects are really cheap, but just a lot of fun. Diner, a cable movie, Barry Levinson's first film. It's basically all uh, almost autobiographical in a way about these five twenty somethings uh, in Baltimore. In the 1950s, and it's got a great cast. You see three of them there. It's Daniel Stern, Kevin Bacon, Tim Daly. Behind them, uh, cut off at the top, are Mickey Rourke, uh, Steve Gutenberg, and Paul Reiser. It's funny. It's poignant. Uh, very dramatic. Um, even romantic at times. Uh, this is sort of an unsung class. It's been forgotten. Um, but just... Whew. Yeah, I, and I'm going to be this way for a lot of the movies in this book, and I already have been for some of them. But um, Diner is one that uh, I strongly recommend. Divine Madness, I've not seen this entire movie, but I remember seeing sequences of it on cable. And, um, you know, Bette Midler, it's her doing a, sort of a stage show. And, uh, you know, she's, a, she's very talented, and she's... Uh, I remember laughing at the one sequence I saw, and I don't want to go into too much detail, but... Um, yeah. The Dorm That Drip Blood. I'm sure Jay of the Dead's going to love this one. Him and I seem to battle all the time over this film. I'm a fan of it. He thinks it spends too much time of uh, talking about packing. It's about these students who are packing up this dorm. They stay behind during the holidays and the killer's on the loose. He thinks that too many scenes are dedicated toward um, uh, talking about like packing things up and getting things ready for the movers. I disagree. 
I think it's a pretty good horror film. Dragon Slayer, I mentioned briefly in uh, one of my previous videos, talking about um, my three uh, most influential directors. This was the movie we were going to see, or we wanted to see, and we ended up seeing Raiders of the Lost Ark. But wow, um, I know Guillermo del Toro has talked about how the design of this dragon, he thinks it should have been like a blueprint any time a dragon was uh, designed for a film, and I agree with him. Um, yeah, strong movie. Definitely check out Dragon Slayer. Draftsman's Contract, another movie some people might not have heard of. Peter Greenaway directed it. It is a comedy, but it and it it's it's sort of a sophisticated comedy. It's it takes place in very in high society, but with body humor and and you realize that you know it, it's it's got almost like some uh, yeah definitely some some risque stuff in here. Uh, it's about a guy he he he's hired to make twelve drawings of, of an estate as a gift. Um, the woman um, the uh, the the the, the Mistress of the house wants to present him to her husband as a gift, um, and his price is uh, for each drawing she must have sex with him, because the husband's away. And it was when he comes back they want to present him with the drawings. Um, and then th the tables are turned on the character on the draftsman. Uh, wow, it, it's it's one of those movies that uh, it's not well known, but it's really some. It's again, I recommend it. Um, the dresser stars two. Uh, Actors who got their start or who became famous, I want to say, in what was bizarre, the British New Wave of the late 50s and early 60s, Albert Finney and Tom Courtney. Uh, Albert Finney, of course, was in Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, uh, which is a great film. And Tom Courtney's screen debut was in The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. Well, here they're together. And it was up for... Um, well, five Academy Award nominations. Same year as The Right Stuff was nominated, I want to say. Um, yeah, I think uh, it's really well acted, especially Albert Finney. He's so good as this aging actor. Tom Courtney is his dresser, gets him ready for each performance. And um, it's an actor's movie, and um, they're both great. Eaten Alive, 1980 cannibal film. Um yeah, another another one of those ones you don't want to go into lightly. It's got some strong scenes in this, uh, very violent scenes. Um, but uh, you know, if you're a fan of Italian horror from this time period, it's one you've got to see. You got to put it on your list. And another sort of cannibal movie, but a very different nature. Eating Raoul, um, low budget comedy uh, starring P uh, Paul Bartel and Mary Warrenoff, as are a couple who. Um, find that they can make money by killing, by luring people into their home and killing them. Um, and uh, I know that um, Robert Beltran, uh, who would play Chakotay in Star Trek Voyager years later, plays Raul, the title character. Um, just a fun movie. It really is. It's a fun film. Um, uh, and it's funny. And um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. And Criterion put out a really nice version of it. The Elephant Man, David Lynch directed... Anthony Hopkins, John Hurt as John Merrick, the real-life uh, deformed um, man who, you know, he had tumors all over his body. That's why he walked around with his bag. He was a carnival freak show for a while until he was discovered by Anthony Hopkins based on a true story, and he became part of high society. He even met with the queen at one point, John Merrick. Um, or I might have been the king at that point. I, I can't remember. might have been the queen. I can't remember exactly when this is set. But, um, yeah. Strong movie. Really dramatic. Produced by Mel Brooks, as a matter of fact. Mel Brooks uh, early on produced this. And there's a few other Mel Brooks movies in here, I think, that he produced. Um, and, I, and I know his wife, Anne Bancroft, has a small part in it as well. The Entity. I think anybody who has seen The Entity um, will never forget it. Barbara Hershey. A very powerful horror film um, from this time period. Escape from New York, John Carpenter, wow. Um, you know, um, for me, when I saw this on cable, it was it was an eye-opening experience, because for me, Kurt Russell was the guy from the Disney movies from the 70s. He was in uh, Super Dad. He was in uh, the Computer Award Tennis Shoes, I think was the title of it. He appeared in a lot of Disney movies back then, and to see him as Snake Plissken early in this movie, I was like, wow. You know, it was it was kind of jarring. Of course, now Kurt Russell has gone on, has gone on to become a great action uh, actor in his own right, and he's still a legend uh, to this day. But um, yeah, that this was this really kind of shook me when I first saw it. 
Evil Dead, I talked about this when I held up the poster in um, my previous poster video, um, or one of the previous, I think it was part two. Um, one of my top ten favorite horror films of all time, and always will be. Um, yeah, it spawned some sequels and remakes, um, and I liked all of them. I did, I enjoyed all of them, but I think this will always be my favorite. Um, and I, we actually discussed this on an episode of um, Father and Son Watch Horror Movies. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's it, check it out. I don't remember the episode number. I'm sitting here struggling. I can't remember the episode number on Father and Son Watch Horror Movies. But um, I got together with uh, Pastor Matt Rollins and his son uh, Jackson, and we talked about the our love for the Evil Dead. So check that out. And oh, and I also discussed it in uh, my 1980s um, uh, briefly in my 1980 in the 1980s uh, top 1980s films from horror movie podcast that we were, uh, was released this past October. Best of the decade. Excalibur talked about this one as well um, in that same video. Um, a big cable film for me. I I don't know what to say. I mean, other than that, um, the great sword and sorcery. Nicole Williamson as Merlin, um, and uh, John Borman directed this. It's just a great telling of the legend of King Arthur. The Exterminator, sort of a low budget. Um, it's a low budget film. I remember there's a scene in this at the beginning where they used an animatronic person for a, th a throat cutting scene. It looks so realistic. At least it did when I watched it. Maybe if I played it back again, I could see it's not realistic, but that's what sticks out. Um, what I remember most about this film, but I also remember kind of enjoying it. It's, it's a little sleazy. I'm pretty sure Cisco and Ebert had this as one of their dogs of the week, um, one year, but, uh, Hey, I liked it. Eyewitness. I remember this playing on cable. I uh, don't remember. I haven't seen it. I don't think I've ever seen it in its entirety, so I don't have a lot to say about it. Fame. Uh, you know, this is the original, directed by Alan Parker in 1980. They did a TV series for Fame. I know they remade the movie recently, um, and it did none of the, the TV series anyway. I didn't see the remake. The TV series did not have the edge that this movie had. This is hard-hitting drama. It really is. It's about a school for performing arts in New York. You follow students through the four years, and um, it's really dramatic stuff. I remember I saw it on cable. I was homesick from school, and we had gotten cable a few months earlier, and I was by myself. I said, what R-rated movie is playing that I can watch? Because I wasn't, you know, really allowed to watch so many R-rated movies. And it was fame, and I was blown away. And uh, aside from being just a great drama and a hard-hitting drama, there's that awesome dance sequence in the streets of New York uh, with the title song playing. Um, I strongly recommend Fame if you haven't seen it. Fast Times at Ridgemont High, one of three sort of teen sex comedies released in 1982. Probably the arguable, no, it, 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 I'd say it is the most famous of the three. Uh, you know, Sean Penn is so good as Piccoli. Um, but it's just a, a good movie in general. You, you know, Phoebe Cates, Wow, I think every guy sort of fell in love with her after watching this film. Fire and Ice. This is my favorite Ralph Bakshi movie. Um, he also did The Lord of the Rings. He did Fritz the Cat. Um, this is my favorite. It's a fantasy film. Uh, it's just so beautiful. And, uh, uh, you know, the fantasy elements are so strong. Um, I like his Lord of the Rings. I really do. And he does use rotoscoping and fire and ice as well in a few scenes. But, um, yeah, this is my favorite of all of his films. First Blood, the first of the Rambo films. Um, people, you know, in the later Rambo movies, they were action-oriented. And they're great. I enjoy them. I really do. They're great action films. But this first one was really meant to sort of say something about the Vietnam vet who was forgotten. And it's just as dramatic as it is exciting. And I think Stallone gives a tremendous performance in this movie. He really does. Um, there's more to this than what would be in some of the later Rambo films, is what I guess I'm trying to say. It's not just action. There's plenty of action in it, but it's not just action. There's more to this film, and, and, and Stallone is so good in it. Uh, Flash Gordon. Um, cable film for me. I remember coming in one time after spending all day outside, and Flash Gordon was on, and I... Watched it start to finish and loved it and um, cheesy, uh, but 
hey, you know, it, Brian Blessed is as the, the leader of the Hawkmen. That's all you need to know. And then actually it's not all you need to know. There's so much more to this movie. It's so cheesy, so campy, but so entertaining. Um, and it was a major part of the movie Ted, if I don't, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with Mark Wahlberg and, um, you know, Seth MacFarlane's movie. I know that um, you know, they, they sort of reference this, this film quite a bit in that. The Fog, another John Carpenter, one of the underrated John Carpenter films. And this is a great uh, Screen Factory release on Blu-ray. Um, Adrian Barbeau, um, Jamie Lee Curtis, um, you know, Tom, Tom Atkins, of course. Uh yeah, I don't know what more to say about it. I want to. I watch it pretty much every year, and um, I have it on the schedule to watch again this year. Um, it's it's you know John Carpenter who is known for so many horror films. Uh, you know he's known for Halloween. He's known for The Thing. Um, you know, and I think he should be known for the Fog. Great opening scene with John Houseman. It's one that gave John Carpenter a lot of trouble through production. He had to reshoot a lot of scenes, and how whatever it whatever happened. The final product is is worth the effort. Four Seasons is a cable film. This is not one that you'd think I'd, uh, you know, at the time I was into like so many other sort of genre films, but I really, really like The Four Seasons. It's so well acted. You really do uh, get to know these characters and, um, you know, it's all about they meet every season to go on vacation. There's three couples. Um, Alan Alden, and Carol Burnett are married in this. Um, Sandy Dennis and Len Carew, I want to say, uh, started out and, um, and Rita Marino and, and Jack Warden are another couple. And then, um, one of them gets a divorce and, uh, brings in a new partner. And now they have to, you know, the other two couples are now on vacation. They're leaving one of the number out, um, and trying to get to know this, this much younger person than all of them who, um, uh, who has become, you know, Len Carew, divorces Sandy Dennis, uh, and um, brings um, uh, Beth Armstrong and becomes uh, his his new wife. And um, very dramatic, very funny, well worth seeing. Foxes, Jodie Foster, only saw this once. Uh, I'll have to watch that again. And then we get into the three Friday the 13th released in this time period. The original from 1980, Friday the 13th Part 2, and Friday the 13th, Part 3 and 3D. Three of the best entries. Um, definitely one and two anyway. Um, three is really good also. Oh, and I do have the 3D glasses still in there. Um, because the, the Blu-ray does have a three. You can watch it in 3D also. With those old crappy glasses they used to give you. Um, yeah, I, and I do like three. I do. I like all of them. I think that, you know, when you're looking at the first four are the strongest. And then six is really good. Um uh, but these three for me, I think, are what really set the stage. Obviously, the what set the stage they were the first three. Um, and, you know, part two is especially underrated, I think. Um, not underrated. I think horror fans really love it. Um, but uh, good movie. That was, that was Jason with the, uh, with the uh, sack on his head. The Fun House, we've covered on uh, the podcast. I know we covered it on Horror Movie Podcast back in 2019. I covered it with, uh, with Joel on his um, Forgotten Flicks podcast years earlier. And um, yeah, Toby Hooper. Uh, you can listen to those podcasts, but we're going to tell you, you got to see it. Galaxy of Terror, I was a little hard on this when I saw it and reviewed it on the blog. I don't know why. I really do love this movie. And I read my review and I'm like, geez, I don't, I read it years later because this was an early one I reviewed. And I remember saying, geez, I don't agree with this. What was I thinking? Um, that's one of the, my regrets. I think I talked about that in an interview with Jay of the Dead. I regretted the review I did for Galaxy of Terror and I'd like to redo it, but who, who's got the time at this point? Gallipoli. Um, again, I saw this directed by Peter Weir. It's got a young Mel Gibson in it. Set, uh, it's a war story. And I saw this... Um, during that uh, Australian, those few months watching all the Australian films. Good movie. The Gods Must Be Crazy. This was sort of a sleeper hit in the early 80s. I remember Siskel and Ebert reviewing it. Um, it's, it's a quirky little film about a pilot who throws a Coke bottle. Uh, he's flying over Africa and he throws it out the window of his small plane. And um, it lands and is picked up by this... Uh, uh, I want to say Bushman. I don't know if that's the right term, but he, he's part of a village that, you know, the, their way of life hasn't changed in thousands of years. And he's marveling at the, you see a picture of it here, marveling at this object and 
brings it back to the village and everybody wants to own it. Everybody wants to hold it. They find all these different uses for it. Um, I haven't seen it in a long time, but I do remember really enjoying The Gods Must Be Crazy. Halloween 2, uh, the awesome follow-up to the original Halloween. And Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. A lot of people really don't like this film because it's not uh, Michael Myers' uh, entry. I really like it. I remember seeing it on cable and really enjoying it. Um, so, yeah. And I know we've talked about this during our Halloween uh, coverage, our Halloween franchise reviews on Horror Movie Podcast, which if you visit the site and the, the bars on the side or the... Um, uh, icons on the side um you go down a, a ways on the website on the right and you'll see an icon for our uh franchise reviews and i think halloween was the first one it might have been the first one we ever did heart beeps um andy kaufman and bernadette peters play robots who fall in love and actually escape the factory where they were being stored um, i know they have a wise cracking robot with them that i think was voiced by henny youngman or at least it tells Henny Youngman style jokes. Um, yeah, I, I don't remember it being a great movie, but it's kind of a curiosity. Heaven's Gate. Let's just pause a second for, on this one. Heaven's Gate was is uh, has such a reputation. Michael Cimino went way over budget. It's the movie that destroyed or almost destroyed United Artists. If it didn't destroy them, it, it just put them out of business. And when it was released, it was a major flop. Critics really just railed it. I mean, they were just, they packed up against this film. And I'm going to agree with F.X. Feeney in the documentary Z Channel, A Magnificent Obsession, when he said that 50 to 100 years from now, people are going to look back and they're not going to understand the hatred that was launched at Heaven's Gate. I have to agree. I, I don't think this movie is nearly as bad. As a matter of fact, I think there are parts of it that are brilliant. And, um, it's very long. I don't know that it has much of a story to support its length, but it has imagery, I think, to support it. Um, and it is a little dusty and dirty at times, but um, yeah, I don't I don't know. I really like Heaven's Gate, and I tend to agree. I think, you know, down the road, um, you know, film critics and, and writers are going to look back and say, why was this movie hated as much as it was at the time? Hollywood Nights, cable film. My brother recorded it. We watched it. My father and my brother and I watched it all the time. It has Tony Danza, Michelle uh, Pfeiffer. It was a very early role, 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 very early role for Michelle Pfeiffer. But the real star is Robert Wool as New Bomb Turk. Um, again, it's I wouldn't say it's a well-made movie because New Bomb Turk does it takes place in one night and it's set in the I want to say the early '60s and it's about this this gang called the Hollywood Nights. And Robert Wool is one of them. Tony Danz is one of them. And Robert Wool is like in almost every scene, every other, well, in every scene in this movie. And there's no way this guy could move around in one night as much as he does. Um, but still a lot of fun. It's just, it's funny. Uh, House by the Cemetery, the third entry in the Gates of Hell trilogy. And this is a movie that inspired um, uh, Ted, Ge Ted Geegan, I want to say, um, to make the 2015 We Are Still Here. Uh, which is one of my favorite horror films of the 2010s. House on Sorority Row. Um, yeah, a slasher from, I want to say, 1983. Not too many people have uh, remembered it as, as one of their favorites, but I liked it. The Howling, uh, along with American Werewolf in London and another one, The Wolfen, which may come up later. I'm not sure if it's in here or not. Um, a 1981 um, Werewolf film. There were three of them released that year dealing with uh, with werewolves uh, in different ways. And this one, um, I know Dee Wallace, I think, is 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 awesome in this. And it's uh, it's great. Humanoids from the Deep. You know, this is cheesy Robert Roger Corman stuff. But damn, if I don't love it, I absolutely love Humanoids from the Deep. And I can watch it anytime. Vic Morrow. That guy was the best at playing villains. Um, I love Humanoids from the Deep. I really do. And it, I know it's cheesy. I know it's you, you can laugh out loud at the times, but damn if I don't love it. Humongous. This DVD made its way across country. Uh, Jay of the Dead asked if he could borrow this, and I remember mailing it to him, and he mailed it back because uh, he really wanted to see the movie. Um, he didn't like it as much as I did. I liked it more than he did. Uh, 
obviously. But I'm saying that because I'm trying to, and I don't remember a lot about it. I got to be honest, I don't remember a lot about the movie, but I do remember enjoying it. In God We Trust. This movie bombed at the box office. It was written and uh, directed by Marty Feldman. He plays a monk, Ambrose. It is a comedy. And, you know, it's one of those films, I watch it all the time on cable. We, I saw it, it stopped playing on cable before we got a VCR, or else I would have recorded it as well. And then it disappeared for a long time. I think there was a problem with the rights to the opening song, because I ended up getting a video copy of this years later, when it finally came to video. And I said, wow, they got a different song over the opening titles. This movie restores the original song, Good For God. And... I'm glad it did. I'm also going to say about this. It's not, it's slapstick. It's not high comedy. All right. It's just not. Um, but Marty Feldman plays a monk. Ambrose, who is sent down to LA to try to get money from a televangelist to save their uh, monastery. Louise Lasser plays a prostitute and his love interest. Peter Boyle plays a traveling preacher who has uh, transformed a school bus into a church on wheels. And at one point during a sermon, he pulls out a ventriloquist dummy of Moses. Uh, who is it? Andy Kaufman plays the televangelist in this film. And I remember the, I reading that he prepared for the role by actually preaching on street corners. And Richard Pryor plays God. Now, if that, that cast alone doesn't sort of spark you to want to see this movie, then I don't know uh, how else to get you to see it. Again, I don't think you're going to laugh out loud at all the scenes. There are funny moments in it. Um, I remember seeing it in the theater, and we laughed like crazy. My father laughed like crazy, and at the end said, oh, that movie was sacrilegious. But he was laughing just as much as the rest of us were, and I remember watching it on cable all the time, and yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those ones that I'm always going to like, even though I, I kind of acknowledge that it's it maybe not, not a great film. Uh, speaking of not great films, Jaws 3, uh, it has its fans, and uh, and they're loyal. And I can't say that I hate it. I just, you know, I saw it in the theater. I saw it in 3D. And it's, again, those glasses always gave me a headache. I, I ended up seeing the end of the movie just fuzzy because I couldn't keep those damn glasses on. Every time I went to see 3D, I did it with Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. We saw that in 3D, my friends and I, and we were amazed at first. And by the end, we all had headaches. It's the same with Jaws 3. Um, but continuing the story in this one, the Brodies are older. Dennis Quaid plays, um, an adult version of the, of the Brody children from the first, I know from the original Jaws and Jaws 2. And, um, 